So I'll just give a quick introduction of our guest lecture today. So Dr. Cigaras is an assistant professor of research and physiology and biophysics at Whale Cornell Medicine. He developed software solutions for the Ang Anglander Institute for Precision Medicine and Institute for Computational Biomedicine with projects spanning over healthcare system design, laboratory information management systems, and pipeline design for computational genomic analysis. His research interests focus on translational artificial intelligence and medicine, leveraging multimodal health data and using new emerging technologies, including augmented and virtual reality, such as HoloLens, MetaQuest, and Google Glass. Uh, so, it is, so it is a great pleasure today to have him with us. Uh, we're very excited to hear Dr. Sigaras's lecture. Um, and he, before we start the lecture, as I always encourage our guest lectures, just to give us a little bit of background on how you got to where you are today. So thank you, and I'll give you the mic now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Polisivis, for the warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, even remotely. It's uh, sunny here in New York, but still cold. Um, and today I'll be talking about the work that we do at Wild Cornell and more specifically about artificial intelligence and medical extended reality. And hopefully some of the terminology is going to be familiar and some that are new will cover through together. Uh, in regards of how I started, we were talking before with Dr. Polosidis, as you could probably tell by my accent, I'm Greek as well. And I started actually my undergrad uh, here in uh, Greece at the University of Piraeus when I studied informatics. And as a student as well, coming now, becoming a professor here, I went for graduate studies to Columbia University to do medical robotics and genomics. And fast forward to today, after almost 10 years being at Weill Cornell, I'm going to be showing you some of the work that we do at the AIXR lab that I direct. Um, for today's talk, I'm going to try to... Uh, show you some of the content of what we do and then reserve the latter half to engage in a conversation. So you can ask me more specific things about me or my work, but I think it's better to expose you first to what we do that will help uh, get better questions and, and a dialogue coming up. So perhaps we could kick start off uh, the, the talk. And first things first, and I know this is Zoom, but I would love your participation. Um, how many people have tried uh, using an augmented reality, virtual reality, or mixed reality? And this is a QR code that you can scan, and this is going to be live, and I'm going to do this together with you. Let me go ahead and unlock my phone, and let me go ahead and open my camera, and go here. So you will see a poll here, and perhaps for me, I've already tried that, and we'll be able to see results why we do this. So... Um, basically, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality are all uh, different technologies that, uh, believe it or not, most of us have already experienced. So for the people that are in the U.S., if they watch practically baseball or football here, augmented reality has always been part of ourselves. If you ever used Snapchat, if you ever played Pokemon Go, you've already used augmented reality. Maybe not in the context of science yet, but... Uh, there are so many different ways that we have already uh, leveraged that. So going back to the talk, we will be discussing under the focus of science in particular of how we have used these technologies. And we're going to take you on a tour of work that's actually here at Wild Cornell Medicine. So before we engage on the journey, just to cover some of the terminologies of what these all are. So the real environment where you guys are all in, I guess, Athens, uh, in theory, or in your home, uh, you experience the real environment. On, on the other side of the spectrum, we have VR, virtual environment, where we are completely immersed in a completely digital world. And to just avoid the jargon and the taxonomy here, think of these terms as where Extended reality is an umbrella term that covers when the real and the digital kind of merge together. You might have heard the term metaverse, and we'll be talking a lot into that. But basically, think of more tangible ways that we're experiencing technology. Like even in Zoom right now, this is actually a virtual background. So there is some sort of virtuality in this space, right? So we'll be going into that in more detail. Now, before we go into the technology representing medicine, I think the most important part is to understand the why 
right? What is the moral compass of why we do this scientific endeavor? And for us particular, the field that I work on is precision medicine. And this is determined by finding the right treatment for the right person at the right time. And it seems that a lot of things have to happen right. And in order to achieve this, both our clinicians and scientists need the information, which is key, right? And information is driven in, in uh, medicine recently from a big data explosion. Uh, I'm gonna start by showing you some examples so that try to weave it with pathophysiology and things that you might be familiar and talk a little bit about our moral compass, which is our patients. So our focus on what Cornell medicine is caring for our patients, push the boundaries of novel discoveries, but also teach the future of medicine like your professors do and help you advance in your uh, careers. So in the first kind of arm in care, this is a story of Irene Price. Irene had publicly accepted to serve as an advocate of that. Uh, she's a cancer survivor that was diagnosed with bladder cancer in 2009. And she followed what is called here a standard of care. So she went through a round of treatment options from surgeries and chemotherapies and all of that stuff that you see already on the slide. And she was ready to call it quits. And working together with her clinician, Dr. Nanos, uh, they came to terms of trying out what precision medicine could offer. So uh, one of the assays, the genomic test that uh, Irene did is called a whole exome sequencing test. Basically, it looks at all 22,000 genes of our human body and tries to understand in the exon region what makes us tick, right? And we found that uh, in Irene in particular, there was a HER2 amplification. One of the genes essentially had a lot of copies, uh, a mutation commonly found in breast cancer. Now, the reason why we mention that is there is a drug that is FDA approved, the equivalent of Philfi, uh in the US, that uh, basically has an already approved treatment for, for Irene, but she was diagnosed with bladder cancer. So what she did with her clinician was what is called FDA of label use. With, I assume Dr. Thelharder, this is very familiar with and could be talking in, in great lens, especially in the pharmacology stuff. The important part is Irene was able to see what was causing the problem, address it, and now be cancer-free and a survivor. Similar to Irene, there's also a story of uh, uh, Dr. Holcomb and Rhonda Kodolchuk. She was suffering from uterine cancer, and she's also now together cancer-free with us. Uh, these survivors are the reason why our clinicians and our scientists push the envelope. It is there that we do what we do and what you will see today. So going to what I was saying before, that big data, we're experiencing this big data explosion. And here are some uh, um, visuals of how close to the moon, if it was CDs, we would be. I don't know why people still do that, but uh, basically what uh, the medical centers and medicine is experiencing now is a data renaissance. And what I mean by that, and the biggest culprit, as I suggested, is genomics. And these are some of the data to give you some sense of, uh, is it astronomical data that we should say, or should we just say it's genomical data, meaning it's so big. And uh, it is projected by 2025, not that long ago from here, uh, that uh, the data that we'll be producing is gonna be uh, uh, really hard to store, really hard to go through and find that killer treatment option. So to achieve that, uh, we use multiple things. We use artificial intelligence and we use also extended reality. And how we use extended reality is to understand big data. So the examples that I show you here show on the top left, me wearing an Oculus uh, Rift, one of the early versions, almost a decade old, uh, on uh, and visualizing uh, a protein structure. Uh, same in the bottom left, where uh, one of our interns, Sophia, is visualizing that with one of the headsets that's called a HoloLens, and it's mixed reality. She's in the lab and looking at the protein structures. Uh, so on the left, we have proteomics. On the bottom right, we have transcriptomics. This is called single cell, and each little dot represents a cancel cell. The technique is called drop seek, and basically, Sophia walks through the data gives a gene name and it lights up. And the way that the cells are 
uh, rearrange, we use something called principal component analysis to arrange them in a specific way in the space and have her interrogate the data, right? Ask for things and see these clusters that we usually see in the figures and papers. The top right, I'm going to be talking a little bit more. Uh, it's called Holograph. It's an app that connects, it's a networks of cancer genes and drugs, aka problem and solution. And we'll be diving into that a little bit more of what is happening and how we're using it. So basically we produce big data. How do we get that big data into knowledge? And how does this knowledge get distilled to, to actionable things that the clinician can do? Like, should they enroll their uh, patient in trial A? Should they give them drug B, et cetera? Uh, so this is key. And through that line of generating the data through the action is the most important part where the human factor comes into play. Now, as I mentioned in the past, AI has received an explosion, especially in medicine, of uh, utilization and how it can be useful. And a lot of, the, of my colleagues ask me, isn't AI what you do enough to, to solve all these problems? AI is very effective as uh, much as you can train it. And sometimes, especially for the last mile, you need the clinician's intellect to be able to shift the data and kind of be able to explore them in a way that AI hasn't yet been trained for. It could go and reach and filter up to the point that it has been trained before. Uh, so basically, we need that uh, coexistence of AI and human to cite like a famous painting. And we're human plays a key role is what you will see today of delivering that care that last mile the mile that doesn't exist and it's very hard to to rely on ai on it so i'm going to be talking today about uh, the projects that we have in care the projects that we have in discover and how we teach also here at wild cornell that you will see it's a little different than zoom with what we were trying lately so on care, I'll tell you two stories, one in our MICUs in the beginning of COVID here in New York. As you might know, New York was predominantly affected, especially in March of 2020. Uh, it caught us by surprise, the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so was in Europe, I think in Italy was where it uh, mostly started at the beginning. And you will see what we did. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we're going to talk about the work in the ICUs and also the work in oncology clinics. Uh, I'll start with the ICU and then I'll finish with Dr. Andreopo that will also be talking uh, later in the next semester. So fast forward to the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, this is Cynthia. Cynthia is a PA at our MICUs, the medical intensive care units at Lower Manhattan Hospital. And the night before, I have been discussing with leadership how to best help to deploy XR in the front lines. Uh, one of the challenges that we had at the time, our uh, best uh, 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 skilled, let's say, clinician, our ARDS expert, uh, Dr. Plataji, ARDS stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome or Severe COVID. Uh, Dr. Plataji was uh, specializing in the ARDS for obesity, one of the biggest comorbidities that would be lethal if a person would be infected with COVID. And she's trying to get to the team, but she has a fractured leg. So she cannot be in the MICUs in person. And she's trying that Zoom, that there's this microphone thing going on. It's hard to talk. People are carrying laptops or devices. It's hard to see, to assess the situation and in come the devices. Uh, this photo is taken moments later that we sorry, moments before the alarm goes off and Cynthia storms in, and we were planning to try this as a pilot. Um, the alarm goes in, she goes in, and they come back and they say, we, we should try this. And I'm like, you already did. What did you think? So they think it's okay. And we started deploying it all across uh, Wild Cornell. We deployed it to Queens Hospital, we equipped LMH, and I'm gonna show you pictures of what we did. This is with Dr. Weir moments before uh, we talked to Cynthia when uh, we started using it to do virtual rounds. So virtual rounds is basically like regular rounding for uh, clinicians that they do, that they go to patient after patient after patient. And virtual rounds in the COVID wing is basically doing this remotely, right? So we switch with David. He puts on the headset. I stand on the laptop. Then he goes to the laptop to try it out. And we try how you could annotate areas. These areas are all blurred out to protect our patients' privacy. 
but uh, there are specific metrics of how they are doing at that time. There is no time to actually enter these data in uh, the medical records. It's a matter of life and death, and they're basically whiteboarding all the stuff that needs to take place. Um, and these are some of the examples of how the device is being used to go to patient after patient after patient. Uh, what were the benefits? Uh, at the time where the beginning of the pandemic started, we didn't even have enough PPE. So we could have people having exactly what is happening in the front lines without having to be there with us, hence protecting them, hence reducing the amount of PPE. But even if someone got COVID and they could spend it at home, we couldn't bring them back in the ICU because they would infect our faculty. Obviously, our patients already had COVID. They wouldn't catch COVID twice, but we needed to protect our staff as a way to be able to not be overwhelmed by the pandemic. So many benefits. The most important part is communication. All the thing that happened in the pandemic was the team was split into two of the remote ones and the first line ones. And now we were able to bridge them together again. Now, uh, same thing with oncology clinics. The story is a little different here. So with Dr. Andrea Oplu, we uh, have a long relationship on building tools specifically for the cancer center. And she's very familiar with the tools that we're building. And she wanted to protect her patients because they don't have COVID, they have cancer. And one of the biggest things that happens when you have cancer is you're immune compromised. So our most vulnerable population that cannot defer their chemotherapy, cancer doesn't stop when a pandemic comes in, uh, we needed to find a way to decongest the rooms and bring the same level of care that we have at File Cornell at the same level or even better to our patients. So one of the ideas that we had with Eleni is how do we create these digital twins? So a digital twin is when you have your patient and their avatar or their medical records overlaid right at each other. Uh, so what Eleni could do is she could talk to her patient while they're going through chemo, see all the uh, information in the medical records and talk and coordinate with the people remote uh, this is Jinin, her PA, of what is the next line of therapy, what should be going on and on. So Jinin was at home. She was pregnant at the time, and we didn't want her to be on site to protect her. But also, we didn't want to bring people in the room that didn't need to be. And uh, Jinin has opened all the medical record tabs, and Eleni just goes in like a surgeon, patient after patient after patient. And one of the things that was the most interesting from this story was the first question. I was never seeing patients. I'm not an MD. My work is on science. I work on building these tools. My lab is a dry lab. Uh, if I get to learn about the patient's identity, we have what is called a patient privacy breach, like through HIPAA rules, that is out of the question. So seeing the patients interact with our clinicians, that they're suddenly wearing all these PP, all these extra gear, uh, was a frightening experience for them. In fact, the number one question that they asked me was, does it emit radiation, right? So technically, uh, it uses infrared light, like our face ID on the iPhone to do it, but it doesn't emit ionizing harmful radiation. The short answer is no, it will not cause any harm to you. Uh, if you get on a more technical, you would lose the patient's understanding when they're going through all these stressful situations. But once they heard, for example, Jinin's voice, uh, that they know, they connect, and they have been spending most of their time while going through their chemos, uh, one of the patients started uh, uh, bursting in tears and asking, how is the baby? Has she given birth? And in, in a split second, the whole room had forgotten that there was COVID, that the patient was doing chemo. And it was a very spe specific moment of how we actually care for our patients. And I had an iPad at the time, and I gave it to the patient to say hello and see that there was a whole care team envelope behind the facade that was like Eleni plus all that. Uh, technical gear that she had strapped onto her face. There is care that is not just finding the right solution, but there is care also about caring about the individual and what they're going through at the time. Benefits similar to the ICU, the most important benefit, further protecting our 
patients, decongesting the room and getting the same amount of productivity or even more that we could do before. So switching from care to research, I was talking about this as a whole graph, a, a network visualization tool. And just to give you more of a scientific context on whole graph, basically, in computer science and anywhere, we need to visualize networks. Uh, your LinkedIn network is a big network of how you connect to your first degree, your second degree, or third degree connections, and so on. In medicine, and more specifically in cancer drug networks, we want to connect specific things such as genes or transcription factors in that case to drugs. Uh, and one of the uh, challenges that we have here, it appears to be very cluttered. And one of the things that we tried to think is if the third dimension and the tangibility could bring value on how we explore what's the next uh, line of drugs. So we started experimenting. So here is an example where we start exploring the laws of physics that makes reality a base, like physical reality obeys Newtonian laws and uh, all the basic principles that we are taught in school. But mixed reality, I can have something in midair or colliding and interacting with our uh, environment. So it, it gives you a new way of how would this be more meaningful to see the data? And how would this be more meaningful to see the data together with someone? So I'm showing you some of the early work that we were doing on the debugging mode. When we wanted to see these heads are just to see where the person is detected, that when I point on an object, like if I point to you at like, I mean, there's a virtual background, like at this specific object, how am I pointing to something that makes sense in your headset? So on the Cetron, one of the drugs that we wanted to point, if I'm pointing it and it's completely in the different location for you, how can we have that same perspective and reference, right? Um, and then we started putting this into effect. So this is one of our two more boards or research conferences. And basically this is a, a meeting, if you might, of our best of the best round table of clinicians, surgeons, uh, pharmacologists, uh, molecular pathologists, oncologists, lab tech, computational biomedicine, everything, where we discuss a case or a patient, basically in a de-identified format, and we discuss what's the best line of therapy. So we give it everything, every single perspective to find what's the best possible treatment option. And one of the things that we wanted to do, so Cornell, is an institute that has four campuses. And the two medical campuses that we have are literally on different continents. One is in New York, the other one is in Qatar. And we wanted to find a way of connecting these two. And for this slide, we selected the server to be on Amsterdam because it looked good on the PowerPoint. You know, There's literally nothing on the cloud that prevents you to put it anywhere as there's no latency. And one of the things that we did So Dr. Shuher, a metabolics expert uh, on the field, uh, was having always a challenge flying 14 hours, going through TSA just for a two-hour meeting. I mean, and a very important two-hour meeting, but yet still like 28 hours of pain through the TSA, dealing with jet lag, et cetera. It's as if I told you, everyone, come and visit New York just for this lecture and then go back, right? That would be a terrible experience. Now, fast forward to today, we started playing with how do we represent things when they're happening remote uh, with avatars and how do we do it in, in person? And I'm going to be showing you also later down in the teaching how this has completely been revamped to something really cool. Um, 
onwards to a different tool that we have. And I'm just gonna fly over through the extended the reality aspects. And I'm gonna focus specifically on the science of how we visualize protein structures. So this is an excerpt of a report that one of the oncologists would get. And this is for a patient that has a grade four glioblastoma. And this particular uh, patient has uh, its gene, specifically the epidermal growth factor receptor, GFR, altered in one specific spot. So the letters that we learned in biology, ATCG, the person has from swapped a single point mutation, a SNP from G2A. And that is causing uh, pruning uh, amino acid change from alanine to threatening at position 289. And what we see from this plot, this is from our CBIO portal, a cancer genomics portal tool that allows you to visualize the genomics data for all your patients, plus what is published on PubMed and so on. We see what is called here a lollipop plot uh, or lolly plot, which is the across that specific gene domain, uh, what is the occurrence and mutations? How many patients have had that specific one? So what this toll line is, is what is called the hotspot. So whether it is from Allen to Valin or to Threnin, et cetera, this is a hotspot. And there is actually an FDA approved drug that targets that called Gifitinib. So as you saw here before, we wanted to find a way of visualizing that data and basically going into the Tom Cruise minority report kind of things that we would, you know, zoom into the data like you do this on your phone to scale. And you would see like I'm turning on the thing like a switch and this is the amino acid representation. So I'm going to be switching to the tertiary structure in a second. I'm just moving my hands and it just moves. And then I'm exploring the data. So this is just painted on every amino acid. And I'm just going to look at the hotspots. So red, multiple occurrence, yellow, less, and so on. And green, bingo, FDA approved drug, also on a hotspot, also on your patient. Um, we started playing a little bit with this, uh, how it interacts in our real world, hiding it behind the desk and so on. Uh, but also we started uh, blending this with AI. So one of the things that we wanted to do is, uh, I'm not going to say the voice assistants because I'll probably trigger them at home. All the usual suspects uh, don't understand medical terminology, right? And one of the things that we actually worked with Dr. Andrea Blue and other colleagues was to train a tool that could understand that. So I'm going to try to play this video. Let's see if it works. Hmm. Very interesting. Weird. Uh, you could try it live, but uh, what I would say, it's on our precision medicine knowledge base. So if you go to pmkb.org, you will see it. So what I'll describe what it is, and I could share the link later on. I don't know why the video isn't playing. Uh, what it's saying is, tell me more about EGFR in blatant glioblastoma. So glioblastoma is not a typical word that you can tell in any of the uh, um, uh, voice assistants and they will understand. So what we did is we created a custom acoustic model. We used every single clinician's voice to say these uh, terms and we tailored it so it understands genes and specific medical terminology. Another prevalent gene, for example, in breast cancer is BRCA1. So BRCA1 is actually tied BRCA1. And one of the things that our clinician said is, tell Siri that I'm not going to go to CS school. The assistant should come to med school and understand the terminology. And when they do, and they can help, then we will talk. We build this, and then uh, they, they started talking together. Um, and that was the protein XR. Uh, I'm going to show you also what is happening on the wet lab on the other side. So I talked a little bit about the dry lab, about the big data. And here is a project that we call MR Lab to bring digital workflows in the real life. So I'm going to show you a little bit of examples of how we do it to do accessioning. So when John Doe's sample comes, we want to make sure that John Doe is John Doe. Right, so not the wrong person gets the cancer diagnosis. Uh, and here is another challenge for when we're processing samples. So the biggest challenge is our lab technicians 
are going to do an experiment with their hands and their gloves and their pipettes. And then they will go to the computer, take their gloves off to prevent contamination and type something in and then put their gloves back on and continue the experiment. So this is productivity and efficient. And we were thinking of what would be a better way of while you're holding your gloves and you're doing the experiment, holding the samples, can I press, like, can I put a sample and can I press add uh, or start the workflow or the experiment and can this capture it digitally? So the physical and the digital, the two worlds that I was talking about have merged into what is called mixed reality. And also on the storage aspect, all of you have fridges at home, but minus 80 freezers are something that we don't usually encounter outside of a wet lab space. So the challenge there, especially for RNA, is when you want to store it, you need to store it in very low temperatures, minus 80 centigrade. And the challenge is when you open the freezer, the temperature rises. So these freezers hold tens of thousands of samples uh, that are arranged, and you will see in a bit, in shelves, racks, boxes, and the box have grids. So if you're trying to find a sample and you don't find it quick, the alarm would go off, you would have to close it and wait. Otherwise, the patient samples are in risk. And you might have heard of that, uh, what was it? Uh, Pfizer's uh, vaccine needs a minus 80 freezer, whereas Moderna, I think, a uh, dozen can be at a higher temperature. So uh, you can understand what were the challenges then when it was more broadly advertised in the audience of how it could you know, not be maintained uh, in regular fridges. Uh, this is a way for us to operate specific, uh, uh, the said specific centrifuge in mixed reality. And I'm not going to go and spend uh, much time in the video. You can find it later on. I'm going to skip through some of the slides so that we have enough time towards the end to have a, a useful Q&A. But basically, it tells you where to put the plug and what to do next. And you can watch videos and so on. So we did several kind of publications on that on how it would increase our productivity. And uh, this was back in 2019, uh, where we created an augmented reality poster to show people what augmented reality is and they could experience it. Uh, this was during the pandemic of how we could do uh, remote assistance to train in mixed reality while we're working on stagger shifts in the lab. And this is some work that we recently published in Arizona and now uh, about creating these SOP guides, comparing the paper form of going through the steps to the mixed reality form. And here is some of the workflow from scanning slides, operating robotic equipment, all the uh, centrifuges or uh, disinfecting headsets and so on. Uh, the other one that I wanna show, let me go to this. Uh, this is some recent work that we presented internally at the Cornell retreat. This is not fully published out yet uh, and shows the storage that I was showing you before uh, with a different way, especially in navigation. So uh, this is the sample of what we were showing before. And when I click store, here's what happens. An arrow appears and tells me where my freezer is. So if I've never been, if you've never been in our lab, you know how to now operate centrifuges and you know where to store the samples. And you can just follow along the arrows to take you to the freezer. And as you go through that, you can inventory without even opening the fridge uh, based and it's color coded. So green, there is space, orange, there is less, red, forget about it. So as the person is here visualizing that information, they just tap or pinch from further away, depending on what they want. And they would uh, go ahead and they would select like a shelf of choice. And then the shelf would tell them, you know, go ahead and click on that rack. And then the rack will come out and there would be boxes and you would select a box, right? So it's like a multi-dimension thing in three dimensions. But from a data aspect, it's several layers to give the location of that, right? So you select a box, the box comes out and uh, basically tells you where there is space and where not. So you're ready to know exactly where to put it before you even open it. And when you do, the box and everything is right in place. And that is MR Lab.
uh, last thing that it would be amiss if I don't show you because we're talking and doing a lecture about education. This is how we do uh, education here at Wild Cornell. So this is an example of giving a lecture in the metaverse. Uh, this is some of my students, hi, Michael and Hauha, where I say with a quick show of hands who has worked on this specific tool before, and you see how they interact. And this is how we were interacting, especially during the pandemic and connecting for the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, this is an example that we're collaborating and I think we're playing with a specific amino acid. And I think Dr. Schuher is showing us a, a specific change in how it would be useful on that particular uh, gene. Um, these are other tools that we have used from time to time to visualize and uh, uh, this is just an example of docking. So this is, uh, I think on the right is able one and on this particular drug is uh, imatinib, one of the drug uh, that uh, basically docks into the area there of able one and inhibits it. And uh, aside from these examples, this is an active pilot that's going on right now. In fact, I was in class earlier uh, this morning uh, for us uh, in Qatar right before the match. Uh, and uh, we're exploring and teaching a course called PBL, Problem-Based Learning, uh, for uh, one of our uh, uh, groups that we have. So this is a case. I think this was a 45-year-old male complaining about back pain. And we're brainstorming what kind of imaging, what kind of blood work, what kind of medical history would we need in order to treat that person. PBL is something that every clinician practices every day for the rest of their lives. Every single patient that comes in tells them a story, says they're in pain, and they have to start troubleshooting and thinking, what are the factors that play a key role to diagnose and then treat the patient effectively? So meetings can happen in computational biomedicine, and there could be avatars like these. Uh, meetings have happened, we have discussed in the past in NBC, what's the future of work uh, look like, especially at the time of the pandemic that has showed us that lectures like these can take place from anywhere in the world. And uh, one of the key things that we learned from teaching is there's, as new technologies become available, there are new opportunities for us to convey that uh, from that data to knowledge into useful knowledge downstream to your careers. Uh, at Cornell, one of the motives that we have right now is to change medicine in several specific factors and redefine it in a different prism, uh, specifically leveraging AI and XR as I showed it to you today. And we believe that some of these tools are the next frontier on how medicine can be practiced, not just by the examples that I showed you, but many other fields that we didn't have much time to cover through. And the key aspect to achieve this is we need students. We need the future of medicine, the future students that are gonna go into this uh, field, whether it is pharmacology, whether it is physiology, biophysics, that in my department is, whether it's gonna be any domain of your choice, we need more of the uh, uh, promising stars to really leverage this technology and if clinicians in the past didn't rely or use computers having you that have believed in breakthrough leverage it in ways unprecedented and find information better and faster than before so closing my uh talk and then we'll, we'll talk about all the other questions that you have i want to acknowledge first my mentors, Olivia Harrell and Andrea, but also acknowledge all my students that I've had throughout the years that without their work, this would be impossible. I'm just portraying the work that we have at the lab here. And uh, the last slide that I have is just to take you on a quick tour of uh, how uh, one of the labs look and talk about how we can connect and where you can learn more information about next steps about working together with us through our internship program that Dr. Polisivis mentioned also that we're in discussions of how uh, people from DRE could actually be exposed to and collaborate with uh, uh, faculty and colleagues from Cornell. And uh, I wanna thank you and open it for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, it's a fascinating lecture and it's, you know, it seems uh, quite far from, you know, the way that healthcare system works here in Greece, but I mean, I hope it's closer than we think. Um, 
so yeah, let's start with some questions from the students. Uh, anyone have a question? See, Marius, you want to go ahead? Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I found it really interesting. And I wanted to ask you about uh, metaverse because mm -hmm. we talked about it a lot. Um, as I think most of us know, medical information and private assessive information is one of the most important things to keep private and protect from you know, people that try to steal it. And with like a very, I don't wanna say bad reputation from like Meta, there have been some attacks that have actually steal data. And what if was if what if that was the case for medical records or for blood tests or for you know examinations? How could we protect this data or how could we make sure that they wouldn't be as vulnerable as the rest of them? Excellent. That's an excellent question. That's what keeps me up at night. How do we leverage that promising technology without compromising the privacy of our patients, right? So to give you an example, these data visualization tools, the whole lens, has a, an iris tracking a camera on each eye, which means the moment that you put it on, it knows that Alex is Alex or if it is Mario's. And if it's not meant for your eyes, like almost like a super spy thing, it doesn't show anything. It says you're not Alex. So the devices that we have can lock the private and sensitive information that we have. Also, when we're talking about the metaverse, specifically when we have sensitive information such as our patient information, then we have to have things fully encrypted and separate of what is considered the public metaverse. So the place where you meet and hang out with friends or you go to a concert or you do other tasks is not the place where medical things happen. The same thing happens in the hospital. Like when you uh, get to receive a lab result, they have to confirm your identity. They don't just call home and just say, by the way, this person is pregnant. You know, there are privacy issues. There are specific things. Your care is tailored to you and is meant towards you. And you get to decide to who to disclose. And there are specific enclaves and in matters of extreme emergency that our clinicians are entitled to break that seal in order to protect your life. But it is very specifically defined all across the world of what needs to happen to protect it. So the tools that we build are hardened with security in mind from the get-go. And for example, on Meta, uh, there are things that they're changing their privacy that we know because we talk to them. Uh, initially, you might have seen, if you're following the news, that Facebook accounts would be required to do VR. And the community, and specifically the medical community, said, I don't think so. And these are changing. So the pilot that we have does not have any personal information. I'll show you, in fact, this of how do we do the study, uh, which is very interesting. Let me go back to the slide. All right. So here's what you see here. Karsten or Dr. Suher, Salman, Anya, and Amid are actual faculty that we disclose their identities. So it's easier for people also to know to refer to. Uh, but one, nine, five, and two are all participants in the study. In fact, I've never met any of them. I don't even know how they look. They chose their avatar to represent themselves of how they want. So we are protecting their privacy. Like all of you, for example, right now, have some of you have your cameras open, some of you have not. Your uh, 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 professors encourage you to open this to engage in a dialogue, but maybe, you know, I don't feel like sharing it. My hair is a little thing. My apartment is a little untidy. I don't want to expose that, right? So in teaching, going in a COVID pandemic, we actually came to your home, right? And this raised a lot of privacy things. I don't know if anyone is even wearing PJs there. I have no knowledge, but I'm still being able to discuss important matters with them. So in that sense, privacy, yes, is very paramount, 
but there are solutions. You just have to be very strict and to explore them carefully. And there are going to be uh, known limitations, and we should address it as a scientific community, raise them, and and help towards building a better tool. Because it's to me, if science is not good enough, we have to invest more to improve it. Right? We shouldn't just say, oh. Uh, medicine, for example, in the medieval era, uh, like the barber and the doctor basically worked in a similar way. And actually, they would come to treat you with blood on their hands and on their you know, gowns because that showed, believe it or not, that they were a good doctor. Fast forward to the century, sterilization, right? Uh, and you would be, oh, this is very straightforward. Uh, wasn't back at that time. So we made medicine better from Hippocrates to today's terms to adapt to that. And I think, to your point, metaverse should be done a lot better, a lot more equitable, a lot more available to everyone. Does that help answer the question? I, I went on a tangent, but I don't know if I covered your concern. Yeah, yeah, it answered this perfectly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marius. Any other questions? Okay, Professor Pavlopoulou. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Sigaras. This was an excellent presentation and congratulations of all this uh, work that you already do at uh, Cornell. It's amazing. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, have you been using at all the alpha fold uh, system uh, to predict, let's say, protein structure or uh, interactions with drugs? Yes. It's phenomenal. Uh, I mean, um, I think so too. Uh, I, I, I got to say, like, uh, there has been a lot of work. Uh, and if you're familiar uh, with a project that started called Folding at Home, I think at Stanford, Vijay Panda started that and was talking about, I remember right, as a student, I had my computer. I, I loved medicine and all of this problems from my dad go. And I would have my computer at night working countless hours, right, to try to do this folding simulation. So protein. my parents would be like, turn this darn thing off we're trying to sleep and it's blowing the fan and i was like we're doing science now you know so <laughs> this would utilize in a distributed way the cycles to help us advance and in fact from that project i know from our neighbors across the street i'm pointing at msk they're literally across the street here in new york how many of these uh uh work has affected these discoveries. You can actually go and see all the papers that have been generated. Going to the alpha fold, how AI could really tackle that. Like I see it is like, I feel we were fighting science with like arrows and like little wooden sticks. And now how AI can help us revolutionize that. I mean, you know, it's like a, a, a child's dream seeing it live of the potential that it holds. AI, like any other field, holds a lot of, uh, um, let's say, promise, but also the ethics part is also something that we have to consider. Not in the alpha fold scenario, but like, okay, so let's say it gave us something. How do we validate it? Right. We cannot go ahead and apply it. Uh, here is the magical drug that I just crunched over and within three hours or I went home and it gave me back an answer. Like, does that mean that I should go with that? Or how does the knowledge, for example, Dr. Fahari, this knowledge in pharmacology is far more than the lifespan of alpha fold, right? So is that good enough? And think of it as this as a combination, not as a replacement. Is that complementing and augmenting the skills? of our esteemed uh, uh, scientists to further their capabilities. So if I was limited back then with a computer that was like an old thing that it made a lot of noise, what is limiting us right now? Uh, do we need a supercomputer? Uh, is AI essentially helping us getting answers faster? Like in, <laughs> we give you context in imaging, we already have tools that can predict tumor types, 
uh, cancer content, a ton of things here at Cornell we have published, uh, or even from an MRI to tell on prostate if it is malignant, where it is focused, et cetera. Translational tools. So tools that basically our clinicians now rely on and say, what else does the computer have to, to show us? In a way, it's a smarter CT scan or an MRI. Uh, and for AlphaFold, I'm glad that you raised it. It's in a scientist realm of the promise, right? It's really remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I think you, so. yeah. well, when I first came uh, you know, across this uh, system, I, I, I was shocked. You know, I couldn't believe that uh, we are there already. It was so interesting, you know, and I, I think in uh, just a, a few months from now, we will see amazing uh, stuff, I believe. Agree, agree. And I think in every now and then in our generation, we get to see these generational leaps, right? And for example, in medicine, in precision medicine that we're experiencing right now, 10 years ago, when we started, precision medicine wasn't even in the wildest dream. Uh, why? Because next generation sequencing technology used to cost ridiculously much. So yes. to sequence, I think the first genome cost $3.2 billion, exactly like a dollar a letter of her genome, unheard of. Uh, so if I said, I want to sequence every single cancer patient that we have and give their tailored treatment options, someone would look at me and say, Alex, this cannot happen. In today's terms, this is a standard of care option. Not, not today. It happened half a decade ago from every single patient. And through discussions with Dr. Polosidis, Precision and other uh, colleagues in Greece, I know that precision medicine in Greece is now in the nascent stage and really coming up. So uh, I think it is almost an opportunity if, let's say, uh, uh, the U.S. is uh, one of the hubs of innovation. It's an opportunity also for other countries to start getting ahead on these and uh, getting the demographics of what we're looking at the phenotypes more evenly distributed, not just the New Yorkers, but like everyone's DNA and makeup is, is different. Very nice. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I, I could ask a quick question. Does anyone else have a question? Professor Theoharides, do you want to comment? Um, no, we can probably talk more about um, postural collaborations when we have the next session. But uh, PPM is something that we should consider actually for the program anyhow. Uh, we, we, we haven't actually added into the agenda pretty much every medical school has a PPL session. And I think our senior students could do very well maybe having at least one or two in the future, a couple of PPL sessions as part of pathophysiology. Um, and in fact, I'm almost thinking maybe I should do almost like a PPL. When is my, my lecture on Wednesday? Yes. Uh, at, at what time on Wednesday? I forgot. At seven o'clock, so the same uh, noon. So, so noon on Wednesday. Okay, so I may actually turn it into a little bit of a PPL session. Um, okay, uh, in any event, I mean, what we just heard is is way beyond uh, anybody's hand, at least in Greece, and probably in many other medical schools in the country yet. I'm struggling every day uh, with uh, colleagues who are not even willing to do just a simple genetic analysis for like five genes we absolutely need to, which are the genes that break down basically, you know, hormones and drugs, et cetera. So, you know, I get, I get these patients who, who are five, six, seven sometimes in drugs, many of them psychotropic drugs, and we have no idea if they're fast metabolizers, slow metabolizers, what. And then I tell them that we should actually do it. And they say, oh, no, no, this is like for the future. So I think just the medical profession has to be brought up today, starting with maybe simple steps, and then all the way to what, you know, Alex Anderson is doing with, you know, Eleni and other colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. So... And you're making an excellent point. We didn't teleport fast forward to the future, right? Uh, we uh, went gradually through there and we followed the same scientific process. Like Eleni did, doesn't just treat her patients using the bleeding edge technology without having 
gone through this uh, evolutionary process That's of how to better care. And so we've done all the baby steps that others uh, would be able to, to go through. But I think the most important part that each scientist should have is question, is the science that I have available at most my disposal the best available? And in any science, like when you go to PubMed and you constantly check what is new, what I would recommend the students is to go and see what is available out there. And if you're thinking of studying away and specifically in the US, you have been exposed to the, 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 the program, I would say, try to find these schools that have that extra thing for, for what you want to do. When I chose my school to go to and later on where to work on, the single factor of choice was what was innovation because I wanted to do things. Like when I go and talk about the things that we do in precision medicine, everybody thinks it's in the future. And I basically show them slides from 10 years ago. And the mismatch is because I think it's also a mentality that can change to, to you know, get and start utilizing the tools. If someone is shooting lasers, why are you using like an old hammer? And uh, especially in fields like pharmacology, uh, the, 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 the revolution of AlphaFold that Dr. Papadopoulou mentioned, uh, you're, you're fighting with like uh, things that are outdated. Um, so uh, definitely encourage what Dr. Thoharevi said, and I'm more than happy to continue the discussion and support it if that's something that we could do. Well, you know, though, um, at the end of the day, and unfortunately, at least in the United States, we're at the mercy of the insurance companies and the HMOs. Uh, and, and I don't know how much of that will eventually be supported. To give you an example, for difficult cases, both at Yale and at Taft and here, um, we used to have like a, a group discussion of the case, you know, three, four, five, six of us will we'll get together. Insurance companies don't cover that anymore. So all of that is falling by the wayside. So I'm just wondering how much of what you so wonderfully are describing will eventually be covered. And I'm saying this only because if it doesn't get covered, it will never actually become kind of everyday kind of practice. That's quite interesting that you mentioned. So um, what, what I would say is we have thousands of patients that have gone through whole exome sequencing. I'm not just talking about targeted panels. And it proves the point not only about the institution's investment, but you need that resounding data, especially even showing it. Oh, I, I, on... You speak into the converted. I have no doubt about it. Uh, my question would be, but not necessarily for now, is how many of those uh, patients, the exome, whole exome actually analysis was covered by insurance? Uh, in the beginning, you're, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. In the beginning, very few. Uh, actually, yeah. Cornell had to say this is a strategic point, and the only way that we can, you know, give life to it is if we invest to it. Fast forward to today, now showing that evidence that it changes the line of therapy, it mm -hmm. makes you a survivor, and actually even saves from the insurance mm -hmm. point of view funds I, of a I, prolonged I, chemotherapy. They saw that it's actually cheaper to treat the patient effectively. You know, I I, I wish that the insurance companies will hear and, and they will change their strategy, but. Uh, for instance, we, we have one particular biomarker that we've shown can diagnose a particular disease. And we've been struggling for two years. A new insurance company, not Medicare, is actually willing to cover it. Um, so it's, it, we're talking just about one easy to measure biomarker. We're not talking about more complicated things. So we somehow have to team up with the powers to be to make things of that uh, change. Because in a large university like Cornell or Yale, uh, you know, there can be other resources that allow the exome sequencing to be done, even for experimental purposes. And of course, publish and show that it saves lives. But how does that translate to everyday practice? It's beyond me. I've gotten so discouraged about medicine over the last you know, 20 years, you won't believe it. And I'm not saying this to discourage our students, it's just to make them aware of the fact that other powers are at play that control the outcomes, regardless how bright or how dedicated many of us or all of us are. So, you, you but anyhow, an we'll keep on fighting. I, I think as a scientist, if you are embarking on that field, I don't think you chose the easy path, yeah, right? Of course. 
Uh, you, you chose it not just because math or biology was easy. It is because it is sure. interesting and appealing to you. And I think the other things that you learn out as a PI later on is all the external factors that affect. If you have solved the hard part, right? It was like it's supposed to be finding the drug that would be the hard part and then telling people with objective data to to utilize it right here is the solution this is what you're you're telling us here's the biomarker the getting into market effectively and finding with the system i find a lot of rps me included dealing and struggling with that system and and from a policy aspect there is more to be desired and more to be improved and uh if only I could use AI for that, you know, and solve that, right? Then I wouldn't just be talking to the converted. Then you would say, where do I sign up? Here's my money, you know, just uh, build a tool that would talk to the, the the bureaucracy and the logistics and will let me do science. Uh, but uh, it is part of that journey, unfortunately, you know, before it becomes that center of care, that adoption is something that uh, you and us are struggling on a daily basis. And uh, take about, for example, the pandemic, how it became politicized, something that is very objectively scientific based and um, misinformation and everybody's opinion trickled in ahead of your referring clinician that knew exactly how to treat you and, and how this led to, you know, clinicians overwhelmed and trying to battle, not just finding how to treat the pandemic, but how to treat the misinformation from that. It's always these these challenges, I think, that we should think of. It's a whole package, right? So there's a lot, basically, what you're saying is it's an iceberg, and the bottom of the iceberg can still be tricky. Uh, so, you know, uh, pursue it if you like it, but it, it's always going to have the challenges, and you have to push through. Yeah, Emerson College in Boston has created a program, well, it was years back, about medical reporting. Um, so it, it, it takes people understanding what you know, what all of us are saying, and be, I guess, brave enough to, to call the shots. Uh, and we just, there aren't very many people around that do that. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, I mean, we, I'm, I'm still absolutely amazed when I hear advertisements for medications in the United States, which don't exist anywhere else, it seems, in the world where they give you this smiley person, you know, doing wonderfully, and then they spend the next five minutes about everything's gonna kill you about that drug. Uh, and then, you know, the consumer is, is left to wonder, you know, what the hell to do with that. And of course the prices are four to eight times higher in the States than anywhere else for the same uh, drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's such a circle of problems uh, in any event. It's also why we need more people following that field and helping tackle all the other problems. So like uh, I see an already solution, like the marketing, as you said, is uh, hideous, right? It's a market that goes super fast. And if only people could read that fast, I've never seen a person that actually <laughs> managed to read it. But it, it shows also the work to be done and a work that uh, like uh, I'm a person of one, I can only do as much. But uh, students and, and people that follow build on science and solve each one a particular problem or more than one uh, that, uh, uh, you know, plagues uh, a specific uh, domain. And I'm, I'm optimistic because it, like I was not expecting for things like AlphaFold to come soon. And I'm positively optimistic also on how the scientific community responded to the pandemic. We wished to have one vaccine, and now we have a ton. And the fact that they were so effective to see it from a scientific standpoint, it's not that we just hit jackpot, we did it again and again and again. And how the community worked together, uh, I think is a resounding uh, optimism of why we should keep pushing for that and how we could give better and improved solutions on that. Like So that's why I'm optimistic. I, I share the, exactly the same sentiments that you do, and it's it's good to have balance. But uh, when I see clinicians like Dr. Andreopoulou willing to put all that gear to care for their patients, that says a lot. It's She would never put it if she thought it would jeopardize. And you don't know Ella any more than I do. 
So that that part speaks volumes of how people are passionate to help and do the due diligence to do it. And, uh, you know, when things get challenging, we push further to achieve it. Good. And Dr. Polisivis, you had uh, one question. Uh, I definitely want to get to. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I just, yeah, I won't keep you much longer, but I just was actually... My question was partly addressed by Professor Theo Khari, this is comment regarding the Medicare. So what my big thing is, I mean, obviously the potential for this, not only in pharmacology, which is like, you know, what I'm mainly interested in, but I'm just thinking even just like in surgery, like just, you know, the applications of reducing errors um, in the clinical practice and, you know, having it, but like, yeah, the thing here is that, you know, because of the whole issue with Medicare, and having providing it as a part of the standard of care. So you're doing this at, at Cornell. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask like the logistics of it. So how is this funded? Um, have, have other institute centers adopted your technology? Um, is there a way to get this to other hospitals? And how feasible do you think it is to have this sort of a widespread use um, over like the next, I guess, decade, I would say, uh, at least in, in the US where you know better the market? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll talk first about our technology and who uses it to uh, how the universities do similar work and how they're investing. Perhaps three on the government side, how does the FDA regulate all these new instruments and what they do about? And uh, uh, let's try to answer some of them. So the, the whole graph tool that I was showing you about drug discovery, we've had it free on the store uh, for a while now, meaning like four or five years, people have downloaded it, hundreds, and people have reached from the scientific community and we have helped them get their networks there. Uh, the biggest challenge that we've seen is not everybody owns a HoloLens and a HoloLens is a $3,500 device. So our focus has been on making this available and make it more equitable to other devices. So for example, a Quest costs a 10th of that. So one of the things that we're working is to get it there and get people a lot more access that they're willing to try. And also, you know, we have these smartphones. Can it run there as well? And can it give us the same level or similar uh, to that? I think that's one of the important factors. So definitely our work is being used, not just here at Cornell in a silo, but uh, uh, broadly available for free to other institutions. Uh, you mentioned surgery, and uh, I think we, we shared the chat, like my previous focus was on medical robotics and, and surgery. And one thing that I learned from this journey is unless it has sub-millimeter accuracy and unless it is effective 100% of the time, you would never, ever, ever consider putting it in the OR room. And you get this with talking with all the colleagues and collaborators that work on the medical field, especially in surgery. You see all these beautiful demos. Uh, they're trying to get FDA clearance. And you ask them, how many patients did you operate today or this year? And the answer is always the same. It is zero. And the reason is not because of how good the clinicians are. Actually, they're really good because they would never jeopardize the, their patients. The headsets, the technology hasn't been miniaturized or effective enough to deal with other factors. So for example, how does this uh, infrared light uh, work on an operating room and how does it deal if the light uh, kind of attenuates or changes and can these all these variant factors affect even by a little? If it is even by a little, no person would do it. I talked to one of our microneurosurgeons that wanted to use this five years ago. And I said, let's say we called Microsoft and they made it all perfect. Would you use it tomorrow? And he's like, are you nuts? Absolutely not. So there is a part that needs to be done on software to train people how to use it, but also the tools have to be as reliable as the microscope and the stethoscope. If they are as rudimentary and as boring in quote as these, then people would use it. So this takes us to how does FDA deal with that? So FDA, right before the pandemic, this was the last event that I got in a pre-pandemic era or was like in February, right at the time we didn't know. Uh, uh, FDA held in, in uh, their uh, headquarters 
a medical extended reality symposium where all the colleagues we discussed of how do we regulate these devices and how like there's these class uh, devices and what does uh, FDA clearance mean and all the technical uh, jargon and the logistical. But basically, this is something that people are interested in investing. And uh, the, the uh, pharmas and the insurance companies are usually the people outside of the room, but very interested to hear what's going on. Uh, I'm thinking as the technology involves and what the future holds is we are going to be able to solve problem by problem. And today we could solve things like PBL. Uh, in fact, uh, there are other problems like in for example, when you visualize a network, even if it is an inch to the right or to the left or a sub-millimeter accuracy, you don't need that accuracy to convey an idea. But where it is in 3D and how you deal with it, it is at the level where I would say good enough to always have 100% a positive effect towards our patients. So to me, it takes a little bit of like, what are the opportunities? And instead of us chasing that final device or that final product, especially the ones that we do research, is to find what are the things, the problems that we can solve today. So for example, and to make it a little more simplistic, when we invented the car, it happened before the airplane. And it could take us to places, but it couldn't fly us to New York. We didn't give it up on that. It's still good enough. It takes you all around in Athens efficiently when there is no traffic. But... If you want to come to the States, probably the airplane is your go-to solution. You wouldn't get the boat, you know? So up until we get to that airplane of these, I think we need to invest to the prototypes like the Wright brothers did. You know, the first airplane that they invented, if you've seen the video footage, you're like, I don't think this is going to make it to the hill. So there is this series of things of where it is pristine enough and boring enough when you get to your airplane, the only thing you care is what movies is there. So in that sense, I think science right now has, especially in the metaverse, all this hot buzz and the spotlight that serves absolutely no purpose. And it should be as transparent and boring and, and uh, you know, a way to just uh, let the clinician or the scientist do their work. Like, have you seen your clinician say what an amazing stethoscope that is? tell me more about it. Like they don't even know. They're like, is it hanging around my neck? It is so rudimentary. The only thing that they care about for the stethoscope is the first day that people would hang it to them because it symbolizes something. Any other day, it's just a boring tool that just augments their thing. Like we wear glasses to see better. We put the stethoscope to hear better. Why not use these tools to experience things better and come to solutions better. It's as, as boring as that. And whoever tries to give you jargon basically is either selling the devices, right? I'm, I'm not selling the devices and I'm not trying to sell the science. I'm trying to find the solutions that, you know, help us go to what Dr. Thelharini said, to the next bigger challenges. Like now that I have a solution, how do I, you know, incorporate to the system? So through that journey, I would say it is key to see how people support it, but also solve each challenge at the time. Hey, Dr. Sigaras, I, I can't help but ask you, what's your opinion on the experiments done on uh, Neuralink? And how, how closely are they in uh, you know, helping people that are blind to see as they claim in a few years from now? or uh, people that uh, have problems with their spinal cord and they cannot uh, move their muscles anymore, they can start uh, walking. Do you think they're very close to what they claim? Uh, so I, I don't know specifically what Neuralink is doing because all the work that they show is usually PowerPoints, right? And videos that, uh, you know, it brings you to, as a scientist, the skepticism that you should in a healthy manner have. But I could tell you from my experience, and I could tell you two names of people that I've worked with, uh, one at Columbia and one at Cornell, of work that they've done specifically on the two subjects that you have. So uh, at Columbia, I work with brain computer interfaces in the robotics lab under uh, Professor Peter Allen. And one of the things of the projects that we had 
was to have this brain computer interfaces. So there's uh, something similar to the Neuralink. It's called an ECOG, basically a chip attached to the sensors in the brain and the neurons. And there's like a spike that basically reads that information, very invasive. So the whole idea is to get it to as less invasive as possible. But a person with a lockdown syndrome, basically quadriplegic or paraplegic, cannot function. What we achieved there, and it's not my work, it's uh, Peter's work, and also there are the postdocs and the PhD students. We had a person with a lockdown syndrome uh, in uh, UCLA that uh, would uh, have this eco device and would look at specific uh, P300 signals. So they would flash in the screen and they would look at the thing of a specific choice. So the task that he had to do was to pick the tide box here in New York by thought. And seeing that monumental thing, uh, of, uh, and there was a lot more science and computer vision and AI involved into that and uh, Jacobian and inverse cinematics and all that. But seeing it grab it, the person said, okay, my thesis can be completed. I'll go to sleep. But the milestone that he achieved a decade ago, right? Just to give you context, yeah, sure. was that a person that was locked down syndrome had superhuman abilities to touch things from the other side of the continent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, to give context to one of our MacArthur fellows or the Genius Award, Dr. Sheila Nierberg, and just to boast about our department, you can go and watch her talk I would say five, seven, maybe eight years ago when she wanted, that she was actively doing this on monkeys to use AI and use the neuron receptors to help them see mm -hmm. uh, monkeys that were completely blind and born blind. And uh, I've never been a monkey. I cannot attest to that, nor did I ever get to try it. But there is resounding scientific evidence on the work that she does. And these are two examples of what others are doing. So in terms of the viability of that tool, I have full faith that we will achieve it. And to me, the most important part that I care for, because the two things that you're touching is, how do we encompass everyone and make everyone part of that ecosystem, right? And mm -hmm. uh, people that cannot walk to come and walk with us or that they cannot see how do we bring them in the same class, in the same humane way that they should be treated. And uh, I don't know if Neuralink does it. In all honesty, I hope they do. I mean, the PowerPoint looks cool, uh, but uh, I honestly don't care who does it as long as they can achieve it. Like at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> you've seen so yes. many, it's so controversial, but it's not a specific person that does it, if you believe in that. It is all the scientists behind that team that are got in a pickle situation that they have to uh, innovate. But it's very hard, right? So uh, when I was working on that field, uh, it was like really testing the limits of what we had available. So uh, again, is it possible? Uh, you know, only time will tell. But am I optimistic on that? Uh, having seen the scientific board and the, the PubMed work, I, I hope for the day in our lifetime that we will experience it. And, uh, you know, like a LASIK surgery for the eyes. Yes. You just go there and do like a pit stop and then you could clearly see. Now, if your vision is just by a little, you might say, I don't really need it or I like I like how I look with my glasses, but it is a choice. A person that is quadriplegic is not by choice. So giving them the choice, I think is monumental. And in medicine, this is what we fight for on a daily basis, how to improve people's lives, their quality of life, and uh, not make them cyborgs, but to give them back things that they might be missing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we kept you a little bit, quite a bit over time. So uh, it's you know, a very, a very nice, fascinating <laughs> lecture and, you know, thought provoking. So uh, Alexandra, we look forward to collaborating with you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the students who are still, still online. Can <laughs> I close with one thing for the students that stayed longer? Uh, if I was talking to my future self, right, or my past self about the future, what I would say is, if your dream is to come to the U.S. or 
pursue this thing. It's closer than you think. It starts by sending an email, reaching out to your professors, asking for advice. And I always thought like, why would they choose me to do blah, blah, blah? It's really hard here. I don't have the same opportunities. The first step you already took, you participated in these kind of lectures that expose you to that technology. What do you do after and how you chase it and how you demand your life to be better towards what you love is what is the, the key factor, what determines whether you achieve it or not. And I was uh, uh, lucky enough to have faculty and mentors that supported me through that. And uh, I didn't send one email and I got one response back. I saw like a thousand emails and I assume Dr. Thoharivis, Dr. Pogodopoulou and Dr. Polisidis did the same thing, uh, but people respond. And uh, when they do, they can be transformational for your projects, for your career, what you want to do. And uh, if you're interested to join the lab or things here, like I have these QR codes for a while for a reason, like use them. And if you didn't get them or didn't get the slides, talk to your professors and say, I want to go to, I don't know, Yale. Uh, I don't know why I would say that, Dr. Theoharidis. I'm inclined to say Cornell, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, or maybe the, UCLA. The key, <laughs> yeah, but the key thing is to see, um, okay, why do I want to go there? Is it because what Dr. Theoharidis does is really useful and I'm passionate about and I want to further that goal? Ask yourselves that, that why and try to find the one that makes you happy. Because as he mentioned, it is a big commitment, you know, but uh, if you do what you love, there, there, there's absolutely not gonna be a, a, a moment that you're gonna have regrets or second thoughts, at, at least speaking from experience. I'm really passionate about what I do and I have been lucky to have amazing colleagues in an institute that they share the same passion. So I would incline you to just do that pursue it. That's my only advice of how I got here. I really wanted to do something completely different. And I thought, you know, as Dr. Prabhupada asked these questions, how do we get there? What does it need to take? Like I, it kept bugging myself and I wanted to see what is out there. Uh, so if you want to find out, just shoot an email and say, Alex, what is out there? Or to whoever you you're interested about their work. You're an, an inspiration, Alex. Excellent advice. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Um, I think we can close now.